Hail and welcome. Paul here, once again. Now in my last lecture, we talked about King Athelstan, son of Edward, who was the son of Alfred, who was the son of Ecbert. We talked about how he became the first king of all the English, how he turned his forebear's dream of a single united kingdom of the Anglo-Saxons into a reality. He was also overlord of the Celts and scourge of the Vikings in Britain as well as from Ireland. However, despite being the foe of the Vikings in his own country, he was supposedly on good terms with the Scandinavians in Scandinavia. In particular, the King of Norway, Harold Fairhair. Now, Harold did in Norway what Athelstan did in England. He united a land of divided kingdoms into a single kingdom. He was pretty famous for that. And according to saga material, Athelstan had sent a ceremonial sword to Norway as a gift for King Harold, only for Harold to be tricked into becoming Athelstan's subject, as receiving the gift of a sword was symbolic of offering fealty. And the messenger said, Here is a sword that King Athelstan doth send to thee. After Harold took the sword, the messenger said, Now shalt thou be subject to the king of England, for thou hast taken the sword by the hilt, as he desired thee. This upset Harold, but he supposedly played an equally clever trick on Athelstan. He had his infant son, which was one of twenty, sent to England, and he pretty much tricked Athelstan into agreeing to be the baby's foster father. Apparently, Athelstan almost killed the child, but Harold's messenger talked him out of it by saying, Thou hast borne the child on thy knee, and thou canst murder him if thou wilt, but thou canst not make an end of all King Harold's sons by so doing. Now this is just a saga, a legendary story. We don't know if all that is true. It is actually thought that Athelstan and King Harold were close allies, and there is archaeological evidence that suggests this. However, it is true that Hakon Haraldson was fostered in the court of Athelstan, that Athelstan raised him as a Christian, and that after he returned to Norway, he went to war with his brother, Eric, who had become king, and ruled Norway as a ruthless tyrant, hated by all his subjects, and supposedly Eric was keen on killing his other brothers so to eliminate dynastic rivals. It is even thought that this is why his nickname was Blood Axe. Not so much that he bloodied his axe, but because he killed his own family members. So Hakon usurped Eric and took the throne of Norway and he ruled as a Christian, and he was the first Christian king of Norway, being known throughout history as Hakon the Good. Eric then went into exile in England, and of all places, to the court of King Athelstan. I guess Athelstan had no interest in taking sides in the sibling rivalry between the sons of Fairhair. And Athelstan even gave Eric his blessing to be recognized as sub-king of Northumbria. Now, after Athelstan's death, the crown was given to his brother, the Atheling Edmund, who he fought beside at Brunenburg. 
Now, supposedly, Athelstan never had any sons, so the throne would be passed through his brothers. And after his brother Edmund died, his other brother, Eadred, took the throne. Now, at this point, Eric Bloodaxe had established himself as King of Northumbria, which Eadred was not pleased about. The previous King of Northumbria was named Olaf Citrixen, a Norse Gael who had been King of Dublin as well. Now, this is not the same Olaf that fought Athelstan at Brunenburg, by the way. Olaf is one of the most popular Scandinavian names. Well, Olaf had been baptized with Edmund as his godfather, and therefore had made himself pretty much a client king, subservient to the West Saxon King of England. But in the year 941, when Eric Bloodaxe took the throne of Northumbria and sent Olaf back to Ireland, he 100% had the support of the Northumbrian people, and he was seen by them as a ruler who would bring them independence from southern dominance. Now one thing that is important to note about Northumbria at this time, now this is close to 100 years after the Vikings took that kingdom. And what you start to see develop there is a sort of hybrid Anglo-Scandinavian culture. Now, as I have said before, the Vikings and Anglo-Saxons were already very similar to each other. And this was especially the case in that northern kingdom, where the folk were a bit more barbaric than those in the south. And in time, the English of Northumbria began to just see their Norse and Danish kings as they would any other king. It certainly seemed that during the reign of Blood Axe, the Northumbrians preferred having a Viking rule their kingdom as an independent kingdom than they did have their kingdom be a vassal state, nothing more than an appendage to the kingdom of Wessex. So King Eadred invaded Northumbria and went to war with Eric. And the Northumbrian people agreed to give in to the West Saxon king, and they sent Eric into exile. And Olaf Citrixen then came back from Ireland to rule Northumbria with Wessex's blessing. But Eric would take the throne back from him five years later. However, by this time, he had fallen out of favor with the Northumbrian people. Maybe he turned into too much of a tyrant, we are not sure, but we do know that his reign ended in 954, around the time of his death. And the cause of his death is unknown, but we do know that this was officially the end of Scandinavian rule in Northumbria. However, Northumbria would never be the same powerful kingdom that it was in the past. In fact, it was hardly even a kingdom anymore. By this point, there was one kingdom of the English, and it was ruled by the West Saxons. After King Eadred died in 955, his 15-year-old son, Edwig, had a very short reign that is said to have had ended on account of disputes between nobles and churchmen. And he would be succeeded by his brother, Edgar, in 959, who was really the next important West Saxon king after Athelstan. Now, Edgar was known throughout history as Edgar the Peaceful. And as the name implies, Edgar wasn't exactly concerned with war. Edgar's main concerns were education, religion, and commerce. Now the thing he is most known for in the education and religion department 
was known as the Benedictine Reform, which he would enforce along with a bishop named Dunstan, who was the abbot of Glastonbury before being driven into exile. Edgar brought him out of exile and made him Archbishop of Canterbury. Dunstan was also Edgar's most trusted advisor. So this was a reform to basically make England's monasteries more like the ones on the continent in France, Germany, Italy, basically following a stricter set of rules involving obedience to God and the church, taking vows of celibacy, which was something that the English church was a little more lax on before. Uh, the monastery would be run by an abbot who is just as devoted to this rule as the monks, while before, monasteries were usually ruled by secular clergies, mass priests who would be married. Monks would also have a stricter guideline as to how their day would be laid out. You had stricter adherence to obedience and the renunciation of one's will. All of this was following the rule of Saint Benedict, who was an Italian saint from the late 5th and early 6th centuries. He was a very important figure in laying out the guidelines of Roman monasticism, which England wasn't following as strictly. Now you might remember in my 7th century lecture, the Synod of Whitby, where the decision was made whether England's church would be Celtic or Roman. And the end result was that it would be Roman. Now this brought England closer to the church on the continent, but Abbot Dunstan and King Edgar's Benedictine reform brought it those few extra steps closer. This turned essentially into a golden age of English monasticism. Now Edgar's next concern after religion and education was commerce. England's economy prospered under Edgar. It reached a peak. And since his reign was very much a reign of peace, hence the name Edgar the Peaceful, we start seeing a demilitarization of England. He at first had a really strong military, a very expensive military, but that began to wane from it not uh, needing to be used. And many of the burrs that Alfred had put up for defensive purposes against the Vikings has started turning more so into centers of trade. But we begin uh, seeing a lessening of the dis defensive structures of them in order to make them more accessible for commerce. We also start seeing a lot of the burrs that were built purely as defensive forts just being abandoned. And new towns in more accessible areas were being put up. Now this was great for England's economy. However, the lack of militarization would naturally backfire. The Vikings are still very much a thing and England is, at this point, making itself vulnerable. This is coupled with the fact that Edgar's second successor was an incompetent fool. Now he was first succeeded by his eldest son, whose name was Edward, but Edward's reign was contested by his brother Ethelred, as Edward was not recognized as his father's official heir. After Edgar's death, you start seeing a divide of people who support Edward as king and people who support Ethelred, and in the end, Ethelred took the crown in 978, which is the same year Edward died. Coincidence?
Regardless, Ethelred ascended to the throne of a very demilitarized England. And this is also right when you start seeing a big second wave of Viking attacks. Now, Ethelred was extremely inefficient in dealing with the Vikings. He was pretty much the exact opposite of Alfred, who, as we know, was known throughout history as the Great. Ethelred, however, is known throughout history as the Unready. Now, this doesn't so much mean unprepared as it does ill-advised, ill-counseled. In fact, his name is very much an Old English play on words, as the name Ethelred means noble counsel. So what the name Ethelred the Unready means is noble counsel the uncounseled, noble counsel the, the not counseled. So Viking raids began really making their comeback in England between the 980s and 990s. And this is after the reconquest of the Dane law, after all of England is pretty much ruled by the English again, and we start seeing new war bands sailing to Britain from Scandinavia. Ethelred fought the Danes in the year 991 at the Battle of Malden. Like the Battle of Brunenburg, this battle is told through an Old English poem. However, this poem describes a disappointing defeat and a Viking victory over the Saxons, but describes a heroic attempt by the Saxons. Now, I am not going to read this poem to you at the end like I did with Brunenburg because it's a very long poem. If you're interested enough, you can look it up yourself. Now, after the battle, Ethelred was forced to pay a yearly Danegeld, which I told you the definition of in my 9th century lecture. Basically, money to pay the Vikings to go away. Now, King Alfred paid his share of Danegeld as well. But with Alfred, it was more a matter of buying time to prepare paying them this money to keep them at bay for now, but also build up an army and build defenses so that we're better prepared to fight them next time. With Ethelred, paying Danegeld became more of an annual tax. And this was extremely counterproductive of Ethelred because he's essentially funding the destruction of his own country. And throughout the 990s and 1000s, the Vikings were attacking in full force. And then, in the year 1002, came Ethelred's next bad idea. Something that would become known as the St. Bryce's Day Massacre. Ethelred's attempt at a complete ethnic cleansing, total genocide of the Danish peoples. This meant not just killing Vikings, but anglicized Danes who had been in England for generations. It is said that this massacre is what gave Ethelred the nickname the Unready. It was just a very bad move on his part. Supposedly in Oxfordshire, threatened Danish families broke into St. Frithwald's church for sanctuary, and the Saxons then burned the church down with them in it. How Christian of them. It is also said that one of the victims was Gunhild, the sister of the King of Denmark, Svein Forkbeard. Now, Svein was the son of Harold Bluetooth, who was the first Christian king of Denmark. He also unified Denmark and brought it into a single kingdom, uh, much like Harold in Norway and Athelstan in England. Uh, now when you hear Bluetooth, I'm sure we all think of the wireless technology. 
You might have even uh, noticed that the logo for Bluetooth is a binding of two runes from the younger Futhark, Hoggle and Burkano. These are Harold's initials, Harold Bluetooth. Now the connection here is that Bluetooth technology would unite devices the way Harold united the Danes. Well, Bluetooth's son, Svein, would attack England in an attempt to avenge his sister's unjust death in the St. Bryce's Day Massacre. These attacks went on for an entire decade. It even eventually got to a point where Ethelred had his own Viking reinforcement to help fight against Svein as he recruited Thorkill the Tall into his service, who was the leader of the Yams Vikings, a powerful group of Viking mercenaries who would fight for Christian kings. However, neither Ethelred the Unready or Thorkill and his Yams Vikings were any match for Svein Forkbeard, and in 1013, Ethelred went into exile in Normandy, and for a brief period, Svein ruled as King of England. A Viking, as King of England. However, his reign in England was very short, lasting little over a month. But then his son Canute came into the picture, and what Canute achieved was greater than any Viking or Saxon could ever imagine. But that is a story for next time. Wastuhal.